verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you know that every tongue, every person that's ever been born on this earth will one day acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior? Now the thing about it is, I trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on April the 4th, 1969, with my dear wife, 19310 Glenwood Lane, New Berlin, Wisconsin. We were saved. Two old-time Methodist preachers came and, and uh, led my wife and I to Christ. That was a wonderful day. I acknowledged it. How, how many of you have had a day when you've been born again and you know for sure that you've been saved? Raise your hand. You've been saved. Okay, you've acknowledged Christ. You've acknowledged Him, so that means that you're a child of God. And that means that you have a home in heaven and you never have to worry about it. You're in the family. Amen? You're in the family of God. And this is a, this is a family meeting here today. And it's so important. The church is so important. The church family, sad to say, especially as we're a week away from Christmas, there are many people, and some of you maybe that are sitting in our auditorium today, there are some of you today <clears throat> that you put your you put your own family ahead of God's family. You should never do that. Now, I hope your family is part of God's family. I, 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 I hope that. But God's family is he, is he an, an important one. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I'll just tell you the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was in a meeting, and they said, your mother and your sisters and brothers are outside the church calling you out. Now, his brothers and sisters, you know, Jesus' brothers and sisters weren't saved. Now, why Mama didn't have them in church, I don't know. But they said, they're out there calling you. And what it, what it, this is what Jesus said. Now, you better take his example. And he said this, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? But they that do the will of my Father. Because what he said, there's some of you that are here right now, that, uh, oh, you're going to, oh, family, family, family. Can't come to church Sunday because going to have a family gathering. Oh, shut up. Shame on you putting God behind your family. Now, I'm offending some people right now. I don't care if I offend you or not because I'm right and you're wrong. You ought to be in church. You ought to be in church, especially if it's, a, it's Christmas and church day. You ought to be in church. Be in church next Sunday because this is the family of God and it's the only family that's in, that really matters. And you say, you mean the... No, I know my family. My, my, I, I, I texted my brother uh, uh, this morning and uh, my oldest brother and uh, from, from... I won't go into details of it, but Proverbs uh, <laughs> chapter 18, what I've talked from today. And um, you see, my brother... He's offended because of Christ, because I'm a Christian and a preacher. And it's, it says that an offended brother has got a wall up and it's going to be hard to get back to him. I texted that verse to him this morning. He tells me, I don't care about your Christianity. You know them verses you send me? I erase them immediately. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? You think that makes me feel good that that, 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 that my brother uh, is offended because of Christianity. See, maybe Christ offends you today. I don't know. If he offends you, you better get over and get on his side because you're going to bow your knee one day. And as I texted out this morning, you're going to either bow your knee to him while you're alive here, which I have and I hope you have. Some of you have and some of you haven't. <clears throat> or you're going to bow to him at the great white throne judgment. There is no general judgment. There's a lot of churches and little Bible manuals and stuff to tell you how to conduct a funeral and things. And it says, at the great general day, no general judgment. There's a judgment of the lost, which is the white throne judgment. Everybody that's at the white throne judgment is going to go to hell. And they're going to have degrees of punishment in hell. That's what's going to happen. But let me tell you this. 
at that great white throne judgment, every one of them, every single one of them, I'm talking about Hitler. I'm talking about Mussolini. I'm talking about everybody, every wicked uh, that's going to have terrible punishment in hell. They're going to bow down before Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. And you will too if you're here and you're not saved. And you will acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior. You'll acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, but He won't be your Lord and Savior because you're going to hell. You'll plead. I don't know what you'll do. But I imagine if you finally recognize Him as Lord and Savior and you can't go to heaven, that's going to be a sad time. Amen? Amen. You know you're saved today? I hope you do. You folks that aren't saved, you're, you're going to bow your knee. If you bow your knee before your last breath comes out, you can, I could tell you of many deathbed conversions. I could tell you many wonderful stories of people saved on their deathbed. And I could tell you some horrible stories of people that were screaming as they were dying going off to hell. <coughs> off into eternity. I don't know if God showed them the fires of hell just minutes before they went or seconds. I don't know. But everybody will acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't forget it. Let's go back to the beginning of this chapter. If there be, Philippians 2 verse 1, If there be for any consolation in Christ of any comfort of love, if any fellowship, see this thing of comfort, love, and fellowship of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. That's, he's the comforter. The comforter has come, the comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven. The promise of the Father. Oh, praise God, the Comforter. I've got the Comforter today. That's what you have to do. Learn to stay in the Spirit. Isn't it sad? You might come here and in church this morning for a moment or two or maybe through the whole service, you might feel the comfort of God and everything. But you go out of here and it, 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 it wanes away a little bit and and then you get in some foolishness out there and, and uh, you don't have the comfort. I'm talking about Christian folks now. I'm talking about people that are saved. But you don't feel the comfort of God. You don't feel the fellowship of the Spirit. You don't feel the closeness of God. D does that happen to some, some of you sometimes like it does me? Does it happen sometimes? Yeah. Now is that God's fault or our fault? It's our fault. Access and comfort and joy and peace and fellowship are always available for the born-again Christian. Always available. I love that. I was reading some stories. Uh, uh, one of the writers uh, put a whole bunch of famous Christians together that were greatly used of God and, and had the fullness of the Spirit in their life and, and how they had that constant joy and peace and winning people to Christ and just having the living on topside all the time. There's some people... That, that have done that and he put a whole bunch of them, I don't know how many all together but it's just chapter after chapter of a different person that really learned how to walk with God you know why I read a book like that because I want to be like them, amen it's available, it doesn't matter what their names were, it doesn't matter but it's available for every Christian you see, and here it is verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded having the same love being of one accord and one mind. You see, what are we supposed to be as a church? We're supposed to be like-minded. We're supposed to be on one accord, the Bible cord, you understand. That's why if we had, if, uh, if we all got some kind of different thing that we call the Bible, how are you going to be on one accord with that? That's why we've settled on, in our church, we've settled on the Bible in the English language, King James. And so that's what we learned. So we're on the same page. I might, I might preach on a verse and you've got some other kind of thing they call the Bible which isn't and it's not in that Bible we wouldn't be in one accord would we huh you can't just take any old thing you want and say it's the Bible we're settled in our church we're settled on the King James Bible in the English language and so uh, we can be then of one accord and of one mind verse 3 let nothing be done through strife or vain glory you see, strife and vainglory, it's not good to fuss with one another, is it? Oh, let's just be honest. Come on now. Quit playing goody-two-shoes now. 
Don't come here to church trying to lie to the preacher and the folks. If you're in here today, is there anybody you fussed with this week since last Sunday? Raise your hand if you fuss with anybody. Look at all these hands up. And if the rest of you, you see, I wasn't just showing you this for an example so you could do it. I fussed with somebody too. Should I have? Yeah. We should. I seen a husband and wife come in here today fussing a little bit with each other. I'm not going to tell who they are. Should I tell you what side of the auditorium they're on? They weren't though. They were just. <laughs> I do. I married those precious people. Amen. Mike and Lisa, God bless them. I love them. They they got married. Then I like some of the other ones out there. They got right with God and figured shacking up wasn't right for a Christian, huh? It's getting awful quiet in here. That Mike and Lisa are for. They got married. They married him. How long have you been married now? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. Wow. I love them like right my own here. kids. Right here. Mm -hmm. Eight and a half years. Maybe I've been here ten years. I've been yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That guy said I'm back now for ten years. Eight and a half years. Mm -hmm. God bless you. <laughs> Marriage is a good thing. Ah, the Bible said, uh, well, I'm sure that Lisa was trying to show that to Mike. If, if a man find a wife, he found a good thing. That's right. Proverbs 18.22. We studied Proverbs 18 today in Sunday yeah. school. We always study usually Proverbs in, in there. And so anyway, he's trying to show it to Mike, and he was looking the other way. And I, uh, <laughs> but a man finds a wife, he found a good thing. Amen. You need it. That's what you need, a good Christian wife. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's in the family or in the church or at work or anywhere. Strife and vainglory is no good. But here's a problem. You know why we strive with one another and you know why we have this vainglory and this fussing? Here's a problem. Because it says, In loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Oh no, you and I are different. We know it all, aren't we? We're going to tell everybody how it is, huh? Why don't you just take the back seat, Amen. Huh? Lowliness. Esteem others better. You say, well, how can I esteem others better when I'm the best? <laughs> you fool, you're full of pride and arrogance. I'm sweeping around here looking. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I just, I just picked four people that I feel are quite proud and arrogant. Is it me? You tell me, is it you? Because <laughs> there's probably more than four. <laughs> In fact, let's just get real honest. How many of us got some of that pride and arrogance in us and we're not taking it? Come on now. Come on now. Got to humble ourselves. How are you going to be? Look. We're fussing and we're agitated. Don't forget, I talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. You ought to memorize that. Great peace have. If you love the Bible and you if you love the Bible, you'll be a good Christian. You'll never get offended ever. Someone can curse you, someone can lie about you, someone can not know what they're talking about. I should. This week I told someone. You don't know what you're talking about. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't, I didn't need to. I mean, let's forget this. I mean, if you know something, fine. But just be humble about it. Amen? And by the way, if you're humble and you know something, I'm, when I say know something, I'm talking about the Word of God and the things of God. Some folks are going to pick it up and you'll be a blessing to someone. Amen? You try to lord it over everybody and tell them how you're so spiritual and they're unspiritual. That ain't going nowhere. They ain't going to pay you no heed at all. Lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, that's our problem, but every man also on the things of others. Others! 
the great man of God, uh, William Booth. I think his first name was William. Was he, he, that founder of the Salvation Army. Was his first William? I know his last name was Booth. I think it was William Booth. The great leader of the Salvation Army. He was up in years and he was about to die. And he, I think he lived up into his 90s. That great worldwide organization of caring for poor people. They were, I mean, you talk about the original street preachers. Well, those were back in the New Testament. But I mean, in modern day age, Salvation Army used to be, I said used to be, they could be today, but used to be street preachers. I mean, they, they were preaching on the street. All over the world, started in England, came over here and went all over the world. They were at the World uh, Conference. They have a conference once, a, once a, a year, a worldwide conference. And it was back in the day just before Booth died. And it says, we've, uh, we've got, a, we've got a, a telegram. Remember what a telegram used to be? You used to get that, do it over like that. Telegram. That used to be a, 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 a form of communication. There's a lot of different forms of communication. You know what the greatest form of communication that ever has been invented? Tell a woman. <laughs> that wasn't none. None of the girls are smiling. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> I'm sorry, girls. Got one with her arms crossed, the other one shaking her head no, and on and on. Oh boy, I got myself in hot water, didn't I? <laughs> Debbie's in a bad mood today. I'm going to get her to smile before the day's over. She usually smiles quite a bit. But anyway, um, they come over to Telegraph and the moderator of the conference, one of his assistants, got up and they're waiting for the message from William Booth, the leader, the General Booth, and it was one word, and the word was others, others, others. Forget about yourself. Someone was telling me this week, oh, I never get nothing for Christmas. Oh, shut up, get someone something for Christmas. Why are you always thinking about yourself? Others. The self life is a terrible life. It's all about me. It's all about me. You know, people, that it's all about you and it's not about others. You are one miserable person. You are absolutely miserable. You're always looking for something else. You're always complaining. You're always griping. I'm just trying to help you. The life of living for others is the life of a true Christian, a humble Christian. That's what we need to get. But every man also on the things of others. Look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ. Wow. I was reading about, my, I forget what the guy's name was. It's different. Might have been Carey. Might have been William Carey, missionary to India, and uh, it was it, it was it was talking about um, when he really realized he had a time in his life when he when he really got a hold of the thing that he he was always seeking God's blessing. He was always seeking God like like. God was there and he was here and always give me the blessing, give me the blessing. And then he said this, he said that he, he realized that he and God were one. You see, when you were saved, you came into the body of Christ and he's here, he's in you right now. Everybody that's here that's saved, God lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God the Father seated on His throne in heaven. God the Son seated at His right hand. And God the Holy Spirit living within you and I that are Christians. But the thing is, when we have God the Holy Spirit living within us, we also have the Father and the Son because the three are one. The three are one. Triune God, one of the great fundamentals of the faith. The triune God, three and one. So, 
And he figured out and he said, <coughs> I have the fellowship with him all the time. Why don't you do this? And since I read that yesterday, I was thinking about this and, and I was just, you know when we get in trouble? I don't know about, I only speak for myself. I speak for myself. When I get in trouble, when I think I'm alone and God's not with me, that's the only time I can get in trouble. Huh? Could I think a wrong thought or say a wrong thing or be in a wrong place if I had the presence of God and I was acknowledging that God is with me and I'm looking for Him of what to say or what to do or where to go? Could I go a wrong place? Never! Could I say a wrong thing? Never! <laughs> Could I think a wrong thought? Never! Because the, the thought is being shared as the mind of Christ because God is with us. And these things that he has overcome, this sin that he has never taken part in, if I can feel his presence, listen now, and, I, and I'm under the constant a hope of the presence of God everything's going to be okay every second every moment that I'm in his presence the Bible tells us in 1st John which I read the whole book of 1st John every day of my life I read it just takes 15 minutes I read it before I go to bed every night every night I'll read it. Fellow slept in the uh, Bible says, confess your sins one to another. Usually if I, I fall asleep in my recliner, a lot of times I studied the Bible and it's, uh, I fell asleep. I woke up at 1.30. I'll confess my sin to you. And I've done that a million times. <clears throat> but every time I've done it, now I almost, here's what it did. And I, I make a, make a, excuse for myself right <laughs> I went in 1 30 I get up I went and when I start messing with my Bible on my phone when I get in bed with my wife it can it can bother her and wake her up I didn't want to wake her up and so for the first time in like forever I didn't read 1st John 1 but wait a minute I wasn't all wrong I laid there because I know if I just laid there I wouldn't bother her I wouldn't have the light on even I got a if there's a night mode where the background is black and the letters are, are, are white but still it it bothers her when I do that and I wake her up and I don't want to do that but what I did is I know it well enough in fact I, I memorized it years ago I memorized it all five chapters of it but I know it good enough that I laid there last night and I went through it chapter 1 chapter 2 chapter 3 chapter 4 chapter 5 and I did a pretty good job of covering it all and I didn't read it but I think I did okay with that I, are, are you letting me slide because I didn't read it did I do okay by just thinking about it in my mind Amen. took me longer to do that but, but might have been better than reading it and I can read it pretty fast if you've memorized it before and you can go through it. I probably, I can read it in 15, 10 or 15 minutes. And probably when I was thinking through it like I did last night, 1.30, probably took me half an hour. So but that's the first time in years, I mean, I, because I, many times I would, but usually what I'll do is I'll, I, I won't, I'll, I'll read it before I get in bed. But I didn't, I got in bed and I was too lazy to get up again didn't do my exercises last night either. I'm in therapy. Anyway, we're going to get in it. Oh, my Lord. Let's go on. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Get the mind of Christ. Do you have it? Yes, He lives within you. You have His mind if you want His mind. You have His mind if you want His mind. You have the mind of Christ if you want the mind of Christ. Hey, when you get into your mess, whatever it is, you ain't thinking about Christ, are you, huh? You ain't thinking about God. You put him out in the backyard or 
on the other side of town. Stay close. You know, that was the first John. I just what I meant to say when I went in law school on first John. It says, he that's born again never sins. You say, well, I do sin. Why do you sin? Why do I sin? Because we get away from the Lord, but the born again part of me can't sin. The born again part of me that's close to Christ and is when the Spirit is leading my spirit, and I'll talk about that in, in uh, Sunday school this morning, <clears throat> that your spirit rules you, my spirit rules me. Whether you're lost or saved, the lost people in here, the, everybody in here, good Christians, bad Christians, everybody, what rules you is your spirit. And the only way to do right or live right is have the Holy Spirit control your spirit because your spirit and my spirit, they control us and rule us. My spirit. And when I put God aside, then my spirit takes over and that born again part of me isn't working and the old carnal self, how many of you get in that spot sometimes like I do? I'm going to try not to. Some of these people, they said that they always walked in. I don't know. I'm going to try it, amen. <laughs> we can work at it, can't we? I'm going to try. <clears throat> I don't think I'm going to reach sinless perfection like some of them said they did, but I'm going to try to work on it. <laughs> Mind of Christ, verse 6, who being in the form of God, you see, <clears throat> he's one of the forms of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery, to be equal with God. See, that's why they call Jesus, what they call Jesus? A blasphemer. Because he said he and the Father were what? They were one, didn't he? you got to have that. You've got to have a God-man. You've got to have Emmanuel. God with us. Amen? Isaiah 9, 6, telling about the birth of Christ, and he wasn't born on December 25th, but we're going to celebrate that next month. That's okay, we can celebrate his birth. By the way, let's just throw this in for free. In the Bible, or in historic Christianity, Christmas was never celebrated. The birth of Christ was never celebrated, never. So don't make like Christmas is some kind of a wonderful Christian holiday. It never was it never was. It, it, it is. It started out remembering his birth. But the only thing that ever was said about the birth of Christ was when he was born. The next year and the year after, they never, they never celebrated. It wasn't a, these, these religious holidays we've got. Nah. <laughs> Resurrection, or what they call Easter, which is a pagan name and hooked in with when Christianity. When the Catholics tried to hook in with the pagans, they... They named Easter. You, you can look up that up. Look it up on Google. It'll tell you all about that. But the resurrection was looked to every day. Every day. Not only resurrection Sunday, but resurrection Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I know you say that calendar come from heathens. I know. But just say it any way you want. Every day <coughs> is resurrection day. It was all through the New Testament they preach mightily to the resurrection of Christ. Preach Christ. Preach the gospel. We'll be studying tonight where <clears throat> we've been in Saturday night, uh, Saturday night, Wednesday night, and Sunday night. We've been looking at soul winning. And we're going to tie in with the soul winning, the filling of the Spirit. That's going to be tonight. Be in your place. Everybody that's here this morning ought to be here tonight. Unless you've got a real good excuse, and you probably don't. Yeah. We're going to become a soul winning church. We're going to be a spirit filled church. Because that's what God wants of us. Amen? Amen. Verse 7. But made himself, this is Jesus, of no reputation. You want to have a reputation. You're going to be known as the big deacon in the church or the big preacher or the big whatever. Jesus had no reputation. He was... He was despised of man, a man of sorrows. That's who Jesus was. Why are you looking to be some big shot Christian? They know big shots in Christianity. You understand that? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. You know what a good Christian is? A servant. You know what the best Christian is? The last one, not the first one. He that will be first shall be last. 
and he that will be last shall be first, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. We, we, we've got to get back to this old-fashioned humility. You have to be humble to be saved. And you have to be humble to be used of God. The reason God's not using you much and because you're not winning many souls or doing much for God, you haven't humbled. It's all about you. That's why you can't win. I, I just, I can't get people to read the Bible. I can't get people to go soul winning. I can't get people hard to do and can't get people to give. Can't get people hard to do anything that claim Christianity. I think many of them are Christianity, but the reason they don't do much for God if they are a Christian is they won't humble themselves. It's all about you. It's my time. I could go into a rant and a rave about next Sunday being Christmas and how many Christians are just forsaking the church, and forsaking God for a family and fun and games and parties and foolishness. Humbled himself and became obedient on the death. Not only just obedient, but obedient unto death who had never sinned. Amen? Never sinned. Even the death of the cross, the most horrific death, the worst death, the death of the cross, that was the most painful. That was the, that was the one, that was the biggie. That was a terrible death, the death of the cross. Verse 9, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and give him a name which is above every name. Isn't that good? And then the text that I text today, this morning, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, my dear one, you're going to confess. I've confessed April 4th, 1969. Some of you have been saved. Some of you haven't. If you don't confess now, you'll be at the great white throne judgment one day and you'll confess that He's Lord and Savior and He's God, but you'll go to hell because it's too late. Because once this old heart stops beating, and once you give up your lifeblood, and, 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 and once you perish, if you die on this earth, you say, well, I'm a Catholic, and they got a, a book for the dead. And I've paid $10,000 for, for they're going to pray for me after I die, try to get me out of purgatory into heaven. <laughs> You're going to hell, friend. 